Thank you for joining us today. Let's get started with a deep sea mining webinar. May I request Angela Asuncion to lead the opening prayer? Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today for our deep sea mining moratorium webinar. And so to begin um, celebrating Earth Day, we wanted to take a moment to share a prayer of reflection. So in times of poly crises, where the climate emergency, wars, poverty, starvation, and biodiversity loss are ever present, let us come together to remember the power of the collective, to take action against socio-environmental justice, and be guided by the sacredness of creation that brings us life in abundance. Let us continue to envision a world of love and hope as we act as stewards for the land that gives life, not only today on Earth Day, but with dedication to protect people and the planet for all the days to come. Thank you so much for joining us today and I'll hand it over back to Sir Jeff. Thank you, Angela. Our agenda for the webinar will include insightful presentations from our speakers representing organizations at the forefront of ocean conservation efforts and related environmental conservation, as well as on mining and sustainable alternatives. Our first speakers will be Emma Wilson and Duncan Curry from the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition, or DSCC, followed by Mary Jane Lamosta from Sustainable Ocean Alliance, or SOA, Angela Asuncion from Bantaikita, or BK, and JB Garg Garganera from Alianza Tigilmina, or ATM. We are encouraging the attendees to ask questions throughout the presentation in the Q&A chat box. This webinar is an invaluable occasion to make the urgent collective call amongst concerned civil society for a moratorium on deep sea mining in the Philippines and globally. Despite warnings from scientists about the considerable damage it, it could do the marine life, some governments uh, persist in developing deep sea mining operations. The moratorium aims to put an end to exploitation, extraction, and extinction, advocating instead a wiser use of existing resources and giving priority to environmental protection, biodiversity conservation, and climate mitigation. At the end of the panel presentations, we'll be collectively reviewing the petition calling for a moratorium on deep sea mining, with a petition will be forwarded to the Secretary of the Department of the Environment and Natural Resources, Maria Antonia Yulo Loisaga, to seek her support in ending this risky industry and safeguarding our oceans. Last, we will end with an open discussion period for questions and identifying future action items as a collective. For our first speakers, let me introduce Duncan Curry and Emma Wilson. Duncan Curry advises the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition on deep sea issues, including deep sea mining and bottom trolling, as well as advising the High Seas Alliance on BBNJ issues. Duncan has practiced international environmental law since 1985, mostly focusing on the law of the sea. Duncan has attended the ISA since 2012 and BBNJ negotiation since 2008. From DSCC as well, Emma Wilson has a background in international organizations and NGOs in the environment and sustainability sector, working on policy, advocacy, and project management. Her previous experience focused on the green transition and corruption issues within the extractive sector with the OECD. Emma holds a master's in environmental policy from Sciences Po Paris, specializing in marine issues. She joined the DSCC as policy officer in December 2021, and today works exclusively on the deep sea mining campaign. Emma is a Franco-British citizen and is based in the south of France. They will be introducing deep sea mining as well as deep sea conservation coalition, the International Seabed Authority or ISA, and initiatives in the Asia Pacific region. Welcome, Sir Duncan and Emma.
Thank you very much, Sir Geoffrey, and hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, shall I get started with my presentation? Sure, yes. Just a quick check whether everyone can see that, okay. Yes, it's clear. Perfect. Okay, so I will start with a quick introduction of the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition um, and who we are and what we do um, and how we can maybe help uh, you and, and your work. And then I'll, I'll give a, uh, an overview of uh, deep sea mining before I hand over to my colleague, Duncan Curry, who will zoom in on um, the institution that is the International Seabed Authority, um, but is in charge of uh, governance uh, of the area and deep sea mining in particular. So the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition, otherwise known as the DSCC, is a coalition of over 100 uh, environmental organizations spread all around the world. Um, we currently run two campaigns, uh, one on deep sea fisheries and the other one on deep sea mining, which of course is the topic that brings us all together here today. Uh, our role as a coalition secretariat is to coordinate and advise our member organizations regarding these two campaigns. So we um, organize a, a number of activities, um, global strategy calls, uh, regional coordination calls. We have a call, for example, for the Asian region, one-on-one um, -on -one meetings where useful, um, and we also provide, for example, letter templates for governments, policy briefs, and communi communications materials that all members can use. So the idea is really just to share information, uh, share policy advice, and give member organizations what they need to take action on these issues. Um, we do also do direct lobby work uh, and advisory work with governments. Regarding the deep sea mining campaign, um, our objective is to establish a moratorium or precautionary pause on deep sea mining in international waters until a number of conditions are fulfilled. Um, the campaign for a moratorium has had a lot of success so far. Um, as you can see here, we currently have 25 countries calling for a moratorium on deep sea mining in international waters. Um, this is a significant advancement um, because only two years ago not a single country had called for a moratorium. Um, you'll note that we don't yet have any Asian countries in this group so we're hoping that will change this year in 2025. Um, other non-state actors that are calling for a moratorium include uh, 47 companies and financial institutions so those include the likes of Google, Samsung, uh, BMW, so we really have some big names in there. Um, you can see a full list on the link uh, in this slide that I'm sure will be shared with you after this presentation. Um, also, uh, a large number of fishing sector groups um, and the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. I saw that there was someone who specialized in human rights on this call, so this might be an interesting aspect for you. This human rights angle of deep sea mining is um, getting more and more momentum um, over the last few months. Um, so that's becoming an interesting um, angle to, to pursue on this campaign. And finally, we also have over 3 million individuals um, that have signed petitions uh, against deep sea mining. And the momentum continues to grow. Um, so if you would like more information on how to join the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition as a member, um, it's free um, and I will drop um, the email address of our wonderful coordinator in the chat um, when I finish my presentation. You can reach out to her and she will help you. Okay, so on to deep sea mining. Um, so I thought I'd start with a little bit about the deep sea. Um, so, you know, just thinking a little bit about, about what's actually down there. 
Um, so the deep sea is generally considered to be the area of the ocean below uh, 200 meters depth. So that makes up 90% of the marine environment. Um, now, when the UN Convention on the Law of the Seas was negotiated in the 1970s, uh, which is when it was essentially agreed that states could strip mine the deep sea, we knew practically nothing about deep sea environments. Um, people essentially thought it was some kind of underwater desert that served no purpose. Now, however, we do know a lot more about these ecosystems. And uh, in 2015, the United Nations uh, declared in its first world ocean assessment that, uh, and I quote, uh, this truly vast deep sea realm constitutes the largest source of species and ecosystem diversity on Earth. Um, it's often said that the deep sea actually contains more biodiversity than even the Amazon rainforest. So because of the very unique uh, conditions of the deep sea, many species reproduce very slowly and adapt very slowly. This is a really important point because it's the very thing that makes deep sea species and ecosystems extremely vulnerable to human disturbance, bearing in mind that these ecosystems have not really been touched by the human hand um, until now. Um, and so, yes, of course, an activity like deep sea mining could wipe out many of these incredible species in a heartbeat. So um, aside from some of the incredible life forms that we find in the deep sea, um, these ecosystems also provide vital services to the global earth system. Um, so of course the deep sea might seem very far away. Most people never go there over the course of a lifetime, uh, but it does actually touch our lives uh, every day. Um, first of all, the deep sea pro provides uh, an important role for provisioning fisheries. Um, it also plays a role in climate regulation. It helps control temperature and absorbs carbon. Um, and also provides a number of our important pharmaceuticals. For example, the COVID-19 test was actually developed from an enzyme found in the deep sea. And of course, um, this area has significant cultural value for a number of cultures. Um, Many island and coastal communities uh, have important spiritual ties with the deep sea and, and with its inhabitants. So what is deep sea mining? The deep sea, of course, also holds metal deposits, which are attracting the interest of a number of actors that want to essentially make quick money. Um, the main metals that are generating interest from mining companies are nickel, cobalt, copper, and manganese. Um, and these metals are found in three different types of substrates that you can see here. Um, polymetallic nodules, that is the, the first target for deep sea mining activities. Um, polymetallic sulfides and cobalt rich crust. Now, to date, um, no deep sea mining has ever actually taken place on a commercial scale, um, only exploration activities. However, uh, we are expecting the application by a mining company for the first mining permit this year, with an aim to start extracting next year in 2025. However, this is, of course, extremely controversial because of the major concerns about um, the environmental risks. Um, I mean, we're really looking at what could potentially be the next major large scale environmental disaster and also significant scientific gaps. Um, you may, some of you may already know that there are over 800 scientists that have signed a statement stating that we do not have enough data to make informed decisions about this activity. Um, and we have multiple blind spots um, with data on the deep sea. Um, it's often said that we know more about the surface of the moon than we know about the deep sea. So this group of scientists is calling for a precautionary pause um, on deep sea mining. So what actually would be the impacts of this activity? Um, so it would essentially strip mine the seafloor, um, scraping 
the surface off and bearing in mind that many organisms do rely on these substrates in order to survive. Um, so there would be a number of uh, direct impacts on the seafloor, which would include species extinctions, biodiversity loss, uh, loss of habitat, and the damage would actually be irreversible given um, the slow forming, slow growing character of deep sea ecosystems um, that I described earlier. There would be further impacts actually along the whole water column from sea surface right down to sea floor. Um, there would be these dual sediment plumes, one coming up from the collector vehicle on the sea floor and one coming down um, from the, the ship um, on the surface. Um, and these sediment plumes, particularly from the surface ship, um, could include metal particles and toxic substances and sediments essentially being pumped back into part of the environment where they're not supposed to be. Um, of course, this activity would make a lot of noise and create a lot of light in otherwise dark areas. So all of these things can be incredibly disruptive to the breathing, feeding um, and navigation of many species including iconic species such as whales um, and turtles. Um, there would also be an issue with increased boat traffic, of course. We're not talking about just one boat going out there to mine certain areas of the deep sea. We're talking about hundreds. Um, so, of course, that increases the risk of injury and death of marine mammals due to ship strikes. Um, if deep sea mining does go ahead on the scale currently planned, it would be the largest mining operation, operation in the history of humanity. Um, Land-based operations are generally more compact because they kind of go down rather than outwards. Um, but, of, but of course, deep sea mining would cover these enormous surface areas. So um, in the first zone that they're planning to mine, which is an area called the clarion Clipperton zone, um, which is found in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, if activities go ahead on the scale planned, it would cover 1.5 million kilometers squared in surface area. So that is the equivalent of uh, Cambodia, Japan, Malaysia, the Philippines and Vietnam. And then um, as for the volume, uh, it would impact 6.4 uh, kilometers cubed in volume, which is three times the Himalayan mountain range from the base to the peaks. Of course, the ocean is dynamic, it moves, so we cannot contain the impacts of this activity in a specific zone. So that is why what we are asking for is a moratorium on deep sea mining unless a number of conditions are fulfilled. Um, so on this slide, you'll see some examples of what those conditions might be. Um, of course, that would be subject to negotiation at the International Seabed Authority by the states that are pursuing this objective of a moratorium on deep sea mining. But some ideas that we have on our side would be, first of all, that there might be a time condition um, so, for example, at least 25 years. Of course, we'd also want to ensure that it can be clearly demonstrated that deep sea mining will not result in environmental damage and biodiversity loss. Um, we're concerned, obviously, that there is not enough scientific data to make informed decisions about whether this activity should be permitted or not. Um, so a condition could be around scientific data. And of course, um, it must be ensured that deep sea mining would not undermine other international commitments to halt and reverse biodiversity loss and protect the ocean. We have a list of those agreements and treaties, um, just some examples in this slide. So I'd like to finish um, with a quick word on, on what you and your organization can do. Um, so, of course, you can uh, organize actions in, in your country or region, um, just a few ideas on the slide, but I'm sure that you guys already have lots of ideas. Um, so please do take a look if you're interested in, in getting involved. Um, obviously, some, some of the activities that already happen among our membership um, involve raising awareness uh, in media outlets with articles and press conferences and op-eds, etc. Um, there, there's a significant amount of protest organization 
petitions as, as I, I know that um, is being organized around this webinar as well, um, social media actions, um, letters to government, uh, and of course actually just sitting down and having those meetings with ministers to discuss this matter. Um, and there is a very nice easy thing that you can do as an individual, um, which I've, I've just put the link in this slide here. Um, we have a, a website uh, via the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition um, website, we have a page where you can call on your government to support a moratorium on deep sea mining by emailing them or tweeting them a kind of pre-formatted uh, message. So that's it from me. Thank you so much for being here and for your interest. Um, the link to our website is on this slide, um, which provides much more information about this issue and how you can get involved. And I'd just like to say thank you so much and um, would welcome any questions at the end. And I will hand back to uh, Jeffrey, maybe, um, and then my colleague, Duncan Curry. Hello, sir, Duncan Curry. Can you proceed now? Sure. I need, I need him as a stop sharing his screen. Take your time, sir. Are oh, you still sharing him up? Sorry, one second. Just how did I do this earlier? on the bottom of your screen? No. Because I'm doing a special thing, it's actually not on the bottom of my screen. I did do it earlier. One second. Oh, there we go. That looks better. Okay, thank you. No. So hello everybody. Um, I'll, I know we're short of time, so I'll be as quick as I can and get straight to just one overview. Is Ahmed Pardo seen as the father of the convention? They don't even give a warning about the excessive rights. Property can give an aspect on resources, exploitation, and so on, and making the point that man's penetration of the deep could mark the beginning of the end for man and indeed his life as we know it on earth so he was actually quite advanced for his time was arbad and he far from presaging a free for all on the on the deep sea he was very cautious about it um very briefly this is a slide of the various um international zones under the law of the sea i just want to point out the International Seabed Authority is responsible for the area on the far right hand side called the area you'll see in the middle of your screen, which is off the continental slope rise and continental shelf. So the, the actual deep sea as such um, under the high seas is the area. And that's the um, property, well, that's the job of the International Seabed Authority to administer as far as minerals activities go. The, the legal underpinnings of the ISA are the Law of the Sea Convention, 1982, a 1994 implementing convention, which I'll outline very shortly, and regulations made under that those two conventions and standards and guidelines. So the, the International Assembly, uh, Seabed Assembly, is comprised of the assembly of all member states to the Law of the Sea Convention, currently 169 parties, the, an executive council, which is a very odd body set up by a number of really arcane criteria of, for example, countries um, with the biggest investment in seabed mining. The Legal and Technical Commission, which I'll talk about shortly because it's actually very important with 41 members, as well as the Finance Committee and the Secretariat. And on the left of your screen, you'll see the various areas which already are subject to contracts 
the International Seabed Authority awards what are called exploration contracts. Emma talked about the carrying clipperton zone in the middle of your screen, and she talked about how big it is on the bottom right of your screen. You'll see the clarion clipperton zone imposed on the map of Canada, just to give you an idea of the size. But you'll also see there are, are areas in the Indian Ocean and the Northwest Pacific Ocean, um, which are primarily for, for cobalt crust or sea mining on seabounds, which Emma talked about. So a number of structural problems, as we see it with the Seabed Authority, the Nuclear Technical Commission, known as the LTC, meets in closed session. It's not open to observers. The whole ISA was designed 40 years ago. There's no scientific committee. These days, you would never establish an organization of this size and importance without a scientific committee or an environmental committee. There's a 1994 agreement, which, which was negotiated effectively behind closed doors by a number of countries after the United States and a number of Western countries in particular were unhappy with the deal in 1982. So it very significantly changed the voting arrangements and the ISA was changed from a body where the assembly was the, the true supreme organ to a, a, effectively a bicameral or two, two cameral house. But the assembly has retained some powers, which I'll talk about in a minute. The voting arrangements are very strange. Um, there was no opt out at all because this is a very old convention. Um, so, th as a result, the ISA Council is very, very loath to vote. They've, they've, they've never had a vote yet. It's very difficult to get, get a quorum of the Seabed Assembly, primarily because it's so difficult to get to Jamaica. It's expensive and expensive once you're there. And a lot of vested interest, primarily the contractors who want to go deep sea mining. It's also out of step with the global concerns. Um, Emma talked about this, so I won't go into this in. in great detail, but I will talk about the two-year rule. This is a very arcane rule brought into place in the 1994 agreement that I talked about. And you'll see that it was really two parts. Firstly, that the ISA was to uh, consider if this two-year rule was triggered, consider passing or adopting regulations within two years. This two-year this two rule was triggered by Nauru, which is the, uh, the sponsoring state of an entity called Nori, which is a subsidiary of the metals company. And they triggered it in, in June of 2020 during the COVID epidemic, uh, pandemic. The Seabed Authority didn't agree uh, rules, regulations and procedures. So the second part of this two year rule is that, is that if that wasn't done, the council shall nevertheless consider and provisionally approve a plan of work. And as Abbott said in her presentation, Nori or the metal company's parent company um, or subsidiary of the metals company and has said that it will be lodging an application for commercial mining after July of this year. So that has caused a lot of concern. And but however, so this, I've given you the bad side. <laughs> so the, the bad side is currently the ISA is negotiating regulations for exploitation of minerals. It's very, very slow going. We had a meeting in March where only about one third of, the, of them were, were discussed at that meeting, about 37 out of 107. But there's a big problem with the exploitation of minerals regulations, the, the known as exploitation regulations, and that's that adopting them will, will effectively green light mining. It will mean that a, a, a would-be miner can lodge an application for seabed mining. So no matter how good they may appear on the surface, um, they will, in effect, give the green light to deep sea mining, and for uh, reasons which I won't, won't go into, but for very arcane, arcane rules um, on voting, it will be extremely difficult to stop an application once it's up underway. The two-year rule I talked about, again, very, very difficult legally, but the good news is that the Assembly is due in last week in July, in the first week in August, to debate a general policy um, which could include a moratorium. So here's a rather complex graph here, but what, what this slide shows is that on the left-hand side, the steps are that if nothing else happens, draft regulations are adopted, standards and guidelines are adopted, a recommendation for plan of work could be made by the Legal Technical Commission, which can only be overturned by two thirds of the council members in all chambers, which is a, uh, again, an arcane construct of the, legal of, of the council. And then finally, at the end of that 
plan of work is approved, what's critical to know that once a plan of work has been approved and a contract has been issued, that contract cannot be amended later on. So it's not like fisheries, which I'm sure many of you are fully aware of, that if there's a problem if you're catching too many um, of the target species or, or bycatch, you can pass a measure and do something about it. Once, on the other hand, once a seabed mining contract has been awarded, it cannot be amended except for the agreement of the contractor, and that is a really serious problem. Um, however, um, under the, and then we talked about a moratorium, this is one potential pathway towards a moratorium, and this is my last slide, is that the assembly can pass a general policy under Article 160 of the convention. The council can then adopt specific policies and or specific decisions to implement that general policy, which again could be a moratorium. And then the seabed authority could be reformed to actually pursue, I think you, Jeff, you talked about this in your introduction, truly sustainable activities such as marine scientific research and exploration for marine genetic resources. So just a few ideas from us and we look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you for this great introduction into the subject. It is now time to introduce our second speaker, Ms. Mary Jane Lamosta from Sustainable Ocean Alliance, or SOA, who will introduce the in in organization as well as their associated DSM-related work and advocacies. Mary Jane is a social entrepreneur and trained marine biologist with a strong passion for promoting awareness of the Sustainable Development Goals. As the Sustainable o o Ocean Alliance, or SOA, Southeast Asia representative, she plays a pivotal role in strengthening connections between 13 youth-led hubs in Asia, comprising over 1,000 plus youth leaders. MJ's responsibilities include leading workshops, fostering international relationships, managing regional funding, and supporting SOA's campaign against the Deep Seabed Mining Campaign. MJ is also the founder of the Tagpi Tagpi Circular Economy Initiative, which aims to empower women-led business in the Coastal Coral Triangle and promote several sustainable development goals. It's your turn, MJ. Hi, good day, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, so thank you so much, Duncan and Emma, for that insightful intro to the original call for moratorium and on the DSM. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is, okay. My name is Mary Jane Lamoste. So I am the Sustainable Ocean Alliance Regional Representative for Southeast Asia. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to the work that we do to support the campaign against deep seabed mining. So before that, let me introduce to you who we are. So Sustainable Ocean Alliance is a global community of youth, entrepreneurs, and experts all collaborating to solve the greatest challenges facing our ocean. So we are active, uh, we are active young people develop, what we do is to activate young people develop and implement innovative solutions and mobilize an ocean workforce to restore the health of the ocean in our lifetime. And to date, um, our global presence is supported by over 80 youth-led hubs. Amongst them are the Asia region, which is uh, composed of 13 youth-led hubs. We have one uh, in the Philippines and all over the world, world, we have about 186 countries with 7,000 active youth leaders. So this is with, with the support of ecopreneurs, investors, policy advisors, and um, um, most definitely the mentors. So our fight towards uh, climate change comes with accelerating solutions, creating jobs, and monitoring coastline for climate change adaptation. So at SOA, we accomplish all these things through two flagship programs. The first one is the Ocean Leadership Programs, which uh, focuses on supporting young oceans with their solutions and awareness campaigns. Meanwhile, the Ecopreneur Network focuses on startup development, 
and providing entrepreneurs with much needed support to build ocean tech solutions. And among the focus of ocean leadership program is SOAS campaign against deep seabed mining, which was launched in June 2019. And as the only organization that has been mobilizing global network of young ocean leaders to campaign, particularly around the International Seabed Authority, we are building young ocean leaders literacy of the rapidly approaching threat of deep seabed mining to equip them with collective actions against deep seabed mining. So SOA invests uh, in people and solution to engage by providing them funds, which is used for uh, DSM activation, strategic support, outreach program in the campaign against deep seabed mining. So this is what we really need and we hope that you know we can do more in the coming years. Then since the launch of the campaign, Thousands of individuals have signed for the petition. Thousands of youth leaders trained and educated about deep seabed mining and more than 20 grants funded for solutions that activate youth against deep seabed mining. In 2022, Sustainable Ocean Alliance uh, launched the deep seabed mining micro grants to support projects such as policy briefs, in-person workshop with government officials, Campaigns calling for national legislation and for countries to take a stronger international stance against deep seabed mining. We also um, support digital campaigns, art competitions, and a DSM mural at the UN Ocean Conference. So I was so lucky that I was able to see the launch of the mural, and it was so amazing that a lot of people took interest with just um, um, like just the launch of the art. I think it expanded. Um, worldwide and i think we are we also decided to expand the grant and um, like last year and this year so for 2023 soa was able to add add additional support to 14 grassroots activation with uh, specific target countries so we have seen new position announcement from several of these countries including portugal and monaco as well as a shift in tone from mexico as um as Duncan has mentioned, it's really intimidating to be in these um, meetings. And I think with uh, the SOAS um, present, the SOA youth presence, the tone uh, during the Mexico ISA assembly meeting has shifted, and you know we are looking forward that it will stay like that. And uh, for 2024, we are also we also have an ongoing deep seabed mining micro grant application that will close close in. Um, in few, in few days, which is in April 30. So this um, mi micro grant is uh, specific for DSM with priority given to applicants from Asia, which is us, Africa and the Pacific. So each grant uh, recipient will receive a maximum of 1,000 USD. And the following slides are the growing momentum of our global community since the launch of the campaign in um, overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed with what's happening. So let's take a pause and focus on things you can advocate at this time. So you can support the Look Down campaign. You can you can search them online using the hashtag. And looking forward, we are working on replication of um, successful grassroots campaign in key countries that are influential to ISA, primarily in Africa, in Asia, and the Caribbean regions. And as a SOA regional representative, today is one of my training sessions for DSM work and potentially um, participation at the ISA uh, meetings. And uh, SOA, I, SOA hopes to send more uh, youth to ISA meetings. So hopefully one of, um, one of the audience present here, one of your youth members could be part of this training and be able to observe them during the ISA meeting. And then we want to continue the, to engage deeply with our campaign partners, including the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition, the Oxygen Project, the WWF, and now the beginnings of Tigil and Alianza Mina and the Bantay Kita and many more to come. With that, I'm looking forward to defend the deep with you. Let's explore uh, collaborations together. 
you can support the Sustainable Oceans Sustainable Ocean Alliance campaign through our website and social media platforms, or uh, you can just send me a message. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mary Jane, for sharing your expertise on the matter and the impacts of DSM. I am thrilled to introduce our third speaker, Angela Asuncion. Angela is an intersectional environmentalist and activist scholar. For the past five years, Angela's expertise has been characterized by her steadfast dedication to amplifying marginalized community voices affected by large-scale mining within research and policy at the local, national, and international levels. Angela is Bante Kita, Publish What You Pay Philippines, Lead Technical Consultant and Just Energy Transition Specialist. Bante Kita is the Philippines National Coalition on Mining Accountability and Community Empowerment. She will introduce Bante Kita, Just Energy Transition and Transition Minerals Work. It's your turn, Angela. Thank you so much, Sir Jeff, for the introduction and happy Earth Day, everyone. Um, my name is Angela Ascension and thank you so much for joining us today. It's such a pleasure to connect with you all. And thank you so much to all the amazing presenters so far. It's been such a great session to learn from everyone. So today my presentation is on green colonialism, the new age of mining under the energy transition as we champion a moratorium on deep sea mining in the Philippines. So first, I'd like to introduce Banta Kita, Publish What You Pay Philippines. So Banta Kita envisions empowered communities that promote sustainable development and good governance of natural resources through transparency and accountability within the extractive industries. So as Banta Kita is the Philippines National Coalition on Mining Accountability and Community Empowerment, we engage directly with the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, EITI, and we are also a commitment holder in the Open Government Partnership, pushing for EITI compliance. Currently, Bantequita has 93 civil society members across Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. So to begin our discussion on just energy transition, it's important to understand the fundamental um, legal mechanisms that are tied to the energy transition. So the Paris Agreement is a legally binding international treaty between 196 governments committed to limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees by 2030 through rapid scale up of renewables. The transformation of our economic systems from fossil fuel dependency to green technology is often referred to as the just energy transition, otherwise known as JET. However, demands for transition minerals such as nickel, lithium, cobalt, and copper, which are necessary to produce green technologies have been skyrocketing. Due to high demand for these minerals, mining licenses are being fast-tracked not only within fragile climate-vulnerable areas such as the Philippines, but also within biodiverse ecological frontiers, which is what we are seeing now with the deep sea mining issue. So last October 2023, the International Seabed Authority, Philippines, had a national capacity development workshop on deep sea matters in Manila. The workshop was being jointly organized by the ISA, the International Seabed Authority, and the Department of Foreign Affairs of the Philippines, as Banta Quita was also the only civil society organization that was invited to this event, and um, we had our national coordinator, Ms. Beverly Bismanos, um, join. So this slide is actually taken from the International Seabed Authority PowerPoint. Um, here we can see that one of the main justifications of deep sea mining is founded on the need to obtain key strategic minerals. So the growing need um, to reduce global warming is closely tied to corporate interests in deep sea mining. So switching to clean renewable energy systems that rely on electrification and battery power is a significant approach for governments, businesses, and other organizations to reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions. Like Emma had mentioned, there are three critical minerals that can be found in the deep sea as identified by the ISA. These are one, polymetallic nodules, polymetallic sulfides, and cobalt-rich ferromanganese crusts. And these translate into the critical minerals that we can see in the middle column. And then these minerals are justified to use batteries, wires, wind turbine steels, um, as well as vehicles and jewelries. 
And so to be able to understand the inherent risks within deep sea mining and the energy transition discourse, we need to understand the energy transition trilemma. So just energy transition discourse has become increasingly co-opted to justify the greenwashing of business as usual mining exploitation. An energy transition trilemma exists within mainstream climate solutions where governments, industries, and civil society engage in inherent socio-environmental trade-offs between one, the rapid phase out of fossil fuels, two, the accelerated scale up of renewable energy, and three, the intensive sourcing of minerals necessary for net zero economies. So the new age of mining under the energy transition poses significant risk of exacerbating climate inequities, not only across the Asia Pacific and the Philippines, but across the world. So these two slides are also taken from the ISA presentations and um, they are indicative of what we're seeing um, related to the rise in green colonialism. So capital driven energy transitions have led to the emergence of new frontiers of environmental injustice and the advent of green colonialism, especially within transition mineral rich underdeveloped nations such as the Philippines. <laughs> So green colonialism is defined as the predatory appropriation of land and resources between the global north and global south through extractivism, which is branded through sustainability and climate solutions. So there are four um, significant issues related to the role of mining within the energy transition. And this ties to their role as well in perpetuating green colonialism. So the first is the intensification of mining exploitation. So the energy transition has catalyzed a mineral boom for all types of mining, as there's no standardized definition for transition, critical, or strategic minerals. The new age of mining intensifies unresolved corruption risks, as well as social, environmental, and economic issues within the mining industry, such as human and indigenous rights violations, environmental devastation, water scarcity, and gender-based um, violence. We're also seeing green mineral um, transition mineral greenwashing. So the mining industry plays a significant role as amongst the world's most polluting industries. The mining industry also employs greenwashing tactics, utilizing just energy transition discourse to market deregulated exploitative practices as a solution to the climate crisis. Socio-environmental justice issues connected to false solutions and the energy transition have also been in, um, on the rise. And these include, for example, deep sea mining and nuclear energy. Geopolitical issues are also a major concern as powerful nations are scrambling to secure bilateral transition mineral agreements with developing resource rich nations. And so transition mineral mining can deepen asymmetric global north, global south dependencies and inequities. Bilateral agreements also contribute to greenwashing, uh, mineral exploitation, as calls to secure transition minerals include non decarbonizing industries such as defense and technology. And lastly, the financial distortion of markets. Transition mineral market volatility presents considerable implications for economic governance and fiscal planning. I'd also like to highlight the role of mining in addressing the climate crisis. So the extractive sector actually remains a significant contributor to the climate crisis, with the industry responsible for 8 to 28% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Transition mineral value chains are also currently carbon intensive as processing and manufacturing operations for renewable technology production require large base load energy largely dependent on fossil fuels. The mining sector is also notorious for large scale deforestation and the destruction of critical climate mitigating ecosystems and with large volumes of carbon dioxide, radioactive and acid waste released during the mining and processing of metals. So through the Publish What You Pay Asia Pacific Transition Mineral Accountability Working Group, we identified um, a fundamental approach to addressing the transition mineral issue. So we identified that there remains a significant need to address the just energy transition silos identified within the climate movement. The Paris agreements must be implemented alongside mineral governance that is underpinned by principles of people-centered justice and climate equity throughout the green technology supply chain a decolonial and rights-based gender transformative approach to energy transitions remains pivotal to ensuring that justice and the just energy transition is defined by the people and for the people. So I'd like to take the time to tie the issue of the, expansive, of, um, the expansion of destructive land-based mining in the Philippines to the issue of deep sea mining under global energy transition discourse. So what does transition mineral mining look like 
for communities hosting the raw materials necessary for a low carbon future. So let's walk through what climate inequity in the Philippines looks like. The Philippines contributes 0.35% to global greenhouse gas emissions, yet we remain among the top three countries in the world most vulnerable to climate change. The Philippines is the fifth most mineralized nation in the world, hosting some of the largest nickel, copper, and cobalt reserves, which are all minerals necessary for the production of green technologies. Philippines is also known as the deadliest place in the world to be a land defender and activist, with mining sector being the most dangerous sector. And despite the nation's resource abundance and significant incentives towards foreign direct investment in the mining industry, mining contributes a minuscule 0.6% to the nation's GDP, with the Caraga region, the mining capital of the Philippines, hosting 33.2% poverty incidence, which is um, significantly higher than the national poverty incidence rate. So what we're seeing is that mining affected communities are not benefiting from the environmental prosperity that has been promised to them through mining operations and legislation, but rather are bearing the brunt of climate inequities and natural disasters, um, as well as pollution related to mining operations. So I also wanted to just showcase quickly um, the climate and energy policy landscape in the Philippines. So as a nation rich in transition minerals necessary for a low carbon future, it remains critical to monitor, map, and assess the progress of climate and energy policy provisions at the national level and identify the energy transition and climate change legal mechanisms that have significant influence on the demand of transition minerals within the nation and are tied to the potential use of just energy transition discourse to push for deep sea mining in national waters. So what we're also calling for is the mobilization between civil society and governments to be able to craft a energy transition policy in the Philippines, which includes um, ensuring a moratorium on deep sea mining in the Philippines is enacted um, as we try to craft a proper mining legal mechanism that will protect um, our waters and um, the, our people as well. And so Bante Kita um, had recently published a scoping study in January, which provides an overview of the transition minerals of nickel, copper, chromate, and cobalt across the islands of Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. These are the transition minerals necessary for the production of renewable energies and technologies. So recognized as the fifth most mineralized country in the world, the Philippines is ranked fourth for um, copper reserves. And sorry, these are also um, the transition minerals and where they're located per region in the Philippines. So like we had mentioned, the uh, Philippines is the fifth most mineralized country in the world and is ranked fourth for copper reserves, fifth for nickel, and sixth for chromite. The Philippines also possesses the fourth largest global reserves of cobalt, which is identified as a nickel byproduct. And the Mines and Geoscience Bureau has projected an increase in 190 mining projects within the next four years under the transition mineral boom. So as we dissect the inherent um, risks associated with the expansiveness of mining in the Philippines uh, um, at the land level, we also need to be able to mobilize action on the upcoming risks of potential deep sea mining um, within Philippine waters as well. So our policy recommendations are focused on um, ensuring that no one gets left behind. And so here we wanted to highlight the um, aspect of transition mineral accountability. So defined by Bante Kita, transition mineral accountability is the need to address the global transition, transition mineral boom alongside democratic principles of community-defined justice and equity, which operates through strengthened human and environmental rights due diligence across the length of the green energy and technology supply chain. So guaranteeing that frontline communities hosting the raw materials are socially, environmentally, economically, and culturally protected from mining and climate externalities. So an overview of policies include, of course, implementing a moratorium on deep sea mining in the Philippines, which is our call for collective action today as we sign the petition to be sent to the Department of, of Environment and Natural Resources, as well as implementation of binding and um, human and environmental rights due diligence mechanisms within extractive operations that align with international laws and human rights standards. We also call on the operation, operationalization of diverse legal tools which would provide social, environmental, and economic safeguards and social security nets for communities and critical climate mitigating ecosystems hosting large-scale transition mineral mining. We support the enactment of 
um, the Philippine Extractive Industries and Transparency Initiative, as well as the subnationalization of the PHEITI to the regional and local levels where extractive activities take place. We also call on um, the creation of a just energy transition, transition mineral accountability, accountability roadmap. And here we would also discuss deep sea uh, mining matters um, with uh, a multi-stakeholder group, as well as propose amendments to the 1995 Philippine Mining Act, or to be able to champion as well the alternative mineral mining bill. Lastly, we want to call on action-oriented research at, um, on the impacts of the transition mineral boom on climate vulnerable communities hosting the raw materials necessary for a low carbon future. So that's the end of my presentation. I just want to also highlight um, this, this photo that we, where we juxtapose um, the increasing media and attention related to transition mineral mining in the Philippines alongside um, photos that Bantekita has taken on the field of communities and ecosystems that are directly impacted by the transition mineral boom. So thank you so much for listening and joining us today. Um, and open to all questions afterwards. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Angela, for sharing a great presentation on the background and context of energy transitions and transition minerals. Next is our final speaker, JB Garganera, who will be sharing an overview of ATM as well as offshore mining advocacies and related issues. JB Garganera is the national coordinator of ATM or Alianza Tegal Mina, leading a coalition opposing large scale mining in the Philippines, actively engaged in environmental justice and human rights movements. He collaborates with numerous organizations, including Green Convergence, Bante Kita, and In Defense of Human Rights and Dignity Movement. With a background in social sciences and anthropology from the University of the Philippines, JB contributes internationally through initiatives like the Philippine Task Force on the Binding Treaty and the Asia Working Group for a Legally Binding Instrument, serving on steering committees for key gatherings such as the Asia-Pacific Gathering on Human Rights and Extractives. He advocates for equitable practices in resource management. As an official CSO delegate, JB represents his country at prestigious events, including UN conferences on sustainable development and Asia-Europe People's Forum and championing transparency and, account and accountability and global resource governance. Hi, JB. Thank you, Sir Jeff. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. I'm very glad to give this contribution to this discussion. So my, the title of my sharing is Resisting Offshore Mining in the Philippines. Um, and in the next 10 minutes, I hope to tackle these four points. I'll introduce our organization, give a short context of offshore mining in the Philippines, and then explain what are the basis for resisting offshore mining, which, while not directly the same as deep sea mining, is closely related to that extractive activity. And then our recommendations as an advocacy group. So what is ATM? We are an alliance, a coalition of different organizations, more than 100 organizations, half of which are community-based operating or present directly in the mining affected communities. The other half of our members are environmental groups, human rights groups, faith-based groups, uh, federations and uh, sectoral groups to, who are providing direct service to the first half of the members. While we are an advocacy group, we also work with local and national governments and we engage in multi-sectoral mechanisms. Um, I have to explain that I don't think there is deep sea mining here in the Philippines. And the ISA has approached the Philippine government last November, November 2023. And I think the Philippines was encouraged to apply for ISA membership and to give its uh, voice as a as as a as a growing 
extractive country about deep sea mining. Currently, there are no policies about deep sea mining in the Philippines. I don't think there have been applications about deep sea. And we're, we're in our last conversation with the DNR last October last year and some informal conversations with them about a month ago, there are no concrete long-term plans. I mean, there's no written long-term plan about deep sea mining in the Philippines. However, it, the, it is worrisome that offshore mining and seabed quarrying have seen an uptick in, in the extractive landscape in the Philippines. So right now, there are 11 approved offshore mining contracts and another seven applications are in the pipeline. None of them uh, fall on the category of the deep sea. Uh, but all of them, some of them, are actually beyond the municipal water. So there's no way of us to actually determine if we have breached the 200-meter depth uh, of these applications. But at least of the three largest ones that we've monitored, they're within the 15-kilometer municipal water. So of the three, we, we think they are not yet uh, categorized on the, in the deep sea. Uh, however, there are increasing number of offshore mining in the Philippines. And seabed quarrying, literally hundreds have mushroomed in the last two years. And these are approved by the national and local governments. And most of them uh, fall onto two, under two categories, black sand or magnetite iron. And 90% of these are going to China. But funny enough, the, the, the remaining 10%, we don't know where they are, so probably it's still China. And then the dredge materials for all this river dredging and seabed quarrying are for reclamation projects in Manila Bay. Now, we offshore, challenging offshore mining and seabed quarrying is a very recent development in our campaign. Eight, Alianza Tigilmina has been doing anti-mining campaign for almost two decades, but engaging in offshore mining and seabed quarrying has uh, just started in the last two years. And in our documentation, a lot of the impacts of offshore mining and seabed quarrying are very, very similar to the anticipated impacts of deep sea mining. Now, the Philippines being an archipelago there is a, a, a big pressure for us to maintain our marine ecosystem and especially the fragile island ecosystem that is within the area. But at this point, let, let me also share between Indonesia and the Philippines. I'm I have close, we are working closely with Jatam and Wali in Indonesia. And we know that the pressure for to be more vocal and to be more active in the deep sea mining campaign is really felt by Philippines and Indonesia. So we're little by little, we are trying to increase our capacities and knowledge on how to respond to the threats and risks of deep sea. But with our documentation of offshore mining and seabed quarrying, we have come up with a primer and a draft situational report uh, in the last four months. And this, uh, and in summary, I think these four impacts or effects is are what is driving the resistance against offshore mining. Number one, we've seen the direct impacts of offshore mining and seabed quarrying to the livelihoods and settlements of coastal communities. Their fish catch has drastically dwindled, some of them even being cut by us up to 35%. And of course, uh, fisher folk communities have been displaced. We have noticed the degradation of coastal area and in fact, some of them are tourist areas. And this has also uh, earned the interest or at least the, the interesting eye of the Department of Tourism on the potential impacts of offshore mining to the tourism industry. We know and we have been in close contact with Marine Science Institute in the University of the Philippines and Oceana, the national Oceana Philippines, just a national campaign uh, on marine ecosystems. And we have sent letters to the government and uh, to some of the offshore mining corporations challenging them 
that there's still a lot of unknown and in fact there are undocumented destruction of marine ecosystem this early on the application stage or exploration stage of some offshore mining but the most uh, i think dramatic basis for rejecting offshore mining is basically the lack of transparency the lack of consent and the lack of social acceptability of this offshore mining project or seabed quarrying projects where even local governments themselves approach us and tell us that they want to help in resisting and challenging offshore mining precisely because both the government and the mining corporations themselves do not have the decency to even talk or present the, to the local government the basic uh, project proposal or feasibility study or the basic uh, courtesy to inform the local governments that they will be starting with offshore mining projects in their locality. Now, given this context of the offshore mining situation here, um, we have listened, we have talked with uh, several international groups who are also part of the thematic social forum on mining. And we have a draft position paper about uh, transition minerals and offshore mining. And these are some of the recommendations that we are going to adopt. Some of them we have adopted. And we will evolve these recommendations as part of the national and international advocacy work of ATM. Let me run down these five recommendations. The Philippine government must delay any application to the ISA until we have completed a comprehensive study of the impacts of deep sea mining to the Philippines. Second, we demand that the government suspend all offshore mining and seabed quarrying activities until a performance audit is conducted to determine their compliance to our domestic laws. Third, we want some assurance that these mining projects will not create sacrifice zones that will deliver the requirements of nickel and copper, but introduce risk and threats to the lives and livelihoods of the affected communities. Fourth, as uh, consistent with what Angela presented earlier on, we are part of that movement here, that we demand a new mining law that is responsive to current realities of climate justice, human rights, and the just transition. Our current mining law was passed almost 30 years ago, and certainly it does not respond to these current realities. Fifth, our national government must fast track the conceptualization and planning for a circular economy. And the other side of the story would be, we hope that the first world countries will be more serious in degrowth and also reducing their consumption and production patterns. Um, let me end by saying, as part of Bantaikita, ATM is part of Bantaikita, we fully support the petition that will be presented later on. And we look forward in engaging uh, DSCC uh, in the international campaign. ATM uh, is in close contact with the deep sea mining campaign, which is a subset of the DSCC. And we are also active in the mining and energy transition working group. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for this opportunity. Uh, thank you so much, Sir uh, JB. And thank you to all speakers for these informative presentations and for sharing with us the potential consequences of deep sea mining as well as all related activities and the importance of having a moratorium not only here in the Philippines, but internationally as well. Now that we have gained valuable insights into the pressing issues surrounding deep sea mining and the imperative need for a moratorium, it's time to turn our attention to our next crucial agenda item, the review of the petition. In the next segment of our webinar, we will delve into the specifics of the petition, examining its content, scope and the overarching goals it seeks to achieve. We will have the opportunity to dissect its key points 
address any questions or concerns, and ultimately chart a course for uh, forward towards its fulfillment. So without further ado, let us transition seamlessly into this next phase of our discussion, where every voice, every perspective contributes to our collective journey towards positive change. So as of this moment, Edison will flash on the screen the letter addressed to the Secretary of the Department of Edu Environment and Natural Resources, or DNR, at Central Office. Then we will give you 10 minutes to, um, to comment the letter, and Edison will do the editing. I will do the facilitation. Uh, Edison, kindly um, zoom, zoom in to make it um, visible. Okay, so the letter is intended for the Secretary of DNR. So that's the uh, introduction, urgent call for a moratorium on deep sea mining in the Philippines and internationally. So you may comment, you can turn on your uh, camera and unmute yourself. So you can suggest, especially in the first, second or body in the last part of the letter with technical terms, later part. So shall I read? It is a great pleasure to write to you today as Bante Kita published What You Pay Philippines, the Philippines National Civil Society Coalition engaging within the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, or EITI, and a commitment holder in the Open Government Partnership, pushing for EITI compliance. The Philippines holds immense potential towards achieving international political victory for the environment and global equity by supporting a moratorium on a dangerous new extractive industry, deep sea mining. Do you have a suggestion here on the first two statements? Hearing none, I'll proceed. We, a coalition of concerned civil society members and citizens, write to you today with an urgent plea for action regarding the looming threat of deep sea mining in the Philippines and in international waters. To empower the nation as a leader in ocean protection, Are you still with me or with us? As custodians of our nation's environmental integrity and stewards of our collective future, we believe it is imperative to address the significant risks posed by these emerging extractive industries. So do you have comments? Suggestions, clarifications in the first paragraph. Okay, I'll proceed. The deep sea is a thriving hub of biodiversity, a major carbon sink, and a treasured trove of marine generic resources, for example. The test used to diagnose COVID-19 was developed using an enzyme found in a deep sea ecosystem. Deep sea, deep sea mining, potentially the largest extractive operation in history and could severely compromise future discoveries for the global common good by destroying ecosystems and wiping out species while any economic benefits would go only to a handful of stakeholders.
Any thumbs up if if there's no correction, suggestion? Okay, kindly I'll proceed to the next paragraph. Edison, please. Okay, scientists are continually warning that the impacts of deep sea mining would be widespread and irreversible and that we do not have enough scientific information to make sensible evidence-based decisions. What more, deep seabed mining is likely to benefit at most only a few countries and aggravate global inequity by negatively impacting other economic sectors. In this regard, pressing pause on deep sea mining has become a flagship issue and a global priority. Are you still here? Can I proceed now? Um, thank you, Duncan, for um, adding that text. So we'll accept that. And Olusola? Yeah, um, uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. yes loud and clear, sir. Yeah, um, I'm looking at that, um, that paragraph. Scientists are continually warning that the impact of deep sea mining um, for the enforcement, if you have um, uh, some sort of um, uh, indigenous scientists, uh, if you can reinforce that statement by saying, by including in particular uh, Filipino scientists, if you, if you have um, uh, a kind of reference, a kind of uh, a coalition of scientists or kind of paper published by Filipino scientists reinforcing this, uh, this argument, you could make a direct reference to 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 Philippine uh, Filipino scientists by saying by saying in particular uh, maybe X Y Z scientists that are known to the government or that are known nationwide in the country that reinforces that kind of um, uh, argument that makes people uh, make um, uh, authority to understand it is not just the uh, uh, global scientists saying it but the the local scientists are also adding their voice to that kind to this kind of um, of conversation so that reinforces it and make government to know that yeah uh, it is not only we're not being told what to do our scientists to actually make a contribution based on their research uh, in this context yeah thank you okay thank you sir Olusola. angela we have something to react I just want to say thank you so much. That was a great comment. We'll do some research and add a line as well. Thank you. Okay, sir. Well taken. Alongside opposition from the UN Higher Commissioner of Human Rights, the private sector, scientists, civil society, youth organizations, and the fishing industry, an increasing number of states are calling for a moratorium or precautionary pause in this industry. Despite these calls, mining could be green-lighted under a legal loophole by 2025, unless a moratorium is in place. Any comments? Um, I have a, a quick comment here. Maybe because we're kind of talking about um, in the Philippines and also internationally, it might be good to specify um, could be green lighted in international waters under a legal loophole unless a moratorium is in place at the International Seabed Authority. Just to make sure we make that distinction between Filipino waters and, and international since we're talking about both here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mom Emma. Uh, Jeffrey, that's a good that's a good change. Uh, if I can maybe just one comment perhaps for you it'll require a bit of wording and maybe some discussion. But a number of groups internationally prefer to take the position of a ban in national waters and a moratorium in international waters. 
So I just wanted to put that out there for your consideration. Um, for example, New Zealand ITRO, where I'm from, the uh, NGO's position is for a ban on seabed mining in New Zealand waters. Um, it's entirely up to you, of course, what you do about that. I mean, I, I completely agree with Emma's change saying a moratorium in international waters. And, and just if, if you think about um, you know, the, the, because the legal position, of course, is quite different nationally and internationally. You, you could implement a ban under national legislation quite simply, and it could also be undone, by the way. Um, whereas internationally, a moratorium is sort of an accepted way of dealing with these issues. Thank you. Okay, sorry, Duncan. So is that correct? Despite these calls, mining could be uh, green-lighted in national and international waters under a legal loophole? No, no, I think I think you need you just need to say green-lighted in international waters, actually. Ah, international. Because the, the yeah, the legal loophole only in the ISA only applies to international waters. Okay. But okay. My, my comment my comment is more with respect to the the chapeau um and immediately following where you say a moratorium on deep sea mining in the philippines and in international waters is crucial and i think there's another mention of it at the, at the, i mean it may not be something you want to fix it out maybe something you want to discuss amongst yourselves i just okay. wanted to put it put it out there okay uh, please take note angela and edison so just to clarify, Duncan, so on the second, on the upcoming paragraph, a moratorium on deep sea mining in the Philippines um, in, 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 in international waters is, is crucial. So um, what would the recommendation be for it, 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 could, it, it could be worded as, as a ban on deep sea mining in Philippine waters and a moratorium on deep sea mining in international waters. It could be as simple as that. A ban on deep sea mining in mining in, in national waters or yeah. in Philippine in Philippine waters, whichever. And a moratorium on deep sea mining in international waters. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for that. And thank you. Okay, are we done? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um Angel and Edison will take that over. Thank you, Sir Duncan. Uh, next, so a ban on deep sea mining in national waters and a moratorium in these, on deep sea mining in international waters is crucial for several reasons. Number one, environmental protection. Deep sea ecosystems are unique and highly sensitive environments that harbor diverse and often undiscovered species. Mining activities in these areas can cause irreversible damage to marine bio biodiversity and disrupt ecological processes and lead to the loss of species that may hold undiscovered scientific or medicinal value. Do you have any comment on number one, environmental protection? Okay, let's proceed. Number two, exacer exacerbation of climate vulnerability. Deep sea ecosystems play a crucial role in carbon sequestration, sequestration, helping mitigate climate change by absorbing and storing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Disturbance or destruction of these ecosystems through mining activities can disrupt this natural carbon sink potentially releasing stored carbon back into the atmosphere and exacerbating climate change. The Philippines is highly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, including sea level rise, extreme weather events, and disruptions to agriculture and water resources. Deep sea mining could exacerbate these vulnerabilities by further degrading marine ecosystems, which provide important services such as coastal protection, fisheries, and livelihoods for coastal communities.
Uh, yes, sir. Hello, Sula. Yeah, uh, if, if I can add, my concern is that each time we state, um, we make this kind of statement, sometimes it's always too, it's too general. So is it possible for you to actually make references or uh, somehow to specific area in Philippines that this kind of activities uh, can directly impact, if it's possible? Is there are places that are so prone? And so when this um, minister or whoever is reading it, can have at the back of his or mind that yes, if this thing goes ahead, we can see an exacerbation in XYZ Delta or in a specific location in the Philippines. So this, this, this drives the message home. So when you are reading, it's not just too general, at the same time, you have a specific location in mind, maybe uh, a particular, you know, low land can be affected or uh, a certain given, uh, given fishing community can be directly impact when this kind of activities goes on. So if you can make a direct uh, reference within the short uh, paragraph, it, it, it can also reinforce the message and you know hit at the, the whoever is reading to understand that, that yeah, the, the ban is important within the, within, within the national water and then supporting the moratorium uh, at the international level is, 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 is important because of direct impact it could make to a certain community within Philippines. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Olusala. So uh, are you referring to the number one and number two description or all description? So it should be specific and it should uh, evident, it should be an evidence based. Like we have to specify uh, what organizations are affected or communities, coastal communities. Okay, Angela and Edison, can we uh, put that into writing? Uh, like we will mention the uh, specific areas. Is that acceptable? Yes, okay, thank you. So we will take note on your suggestion, sir. And thank you so much. Next, please, number three. Okay, unknown impacts. Our understanding of deep sea ecosystems and the potential impacts of mining activities remains remain limited. There is a lack of comprehensive scientific research on the long-term consequences of deep sea mining, making it difficult to assess and mitigate potential risks effectively. Moreover, the Philippines lacks technical capacity or ad advancements to properly monitor, assess, and evaluate the impacts of deep sea mining in nearby waters. So same comment on number one and two. Uh, can we uh, specifically state the locations or the affected area as to the impacts that there are unknown impacts? Okay, let's take note on that. Number four, uh, global commons. The deep sea is considered part of the global commons, belonging to all humanity. Exploitation of deep sea resources by one country can have implications for the sacred indigenous lands and marine environment and biodiversity beyond national borders. Therefore, decisions regarding deep sea mining should be made with careful consideration of the broader global impact. Number five, sustainable development. The benefits of deep sea mining are often overstated while the potential costs and risks are underestimated. Instead of pursuing short-term economic gains from resource extraction, there is a need to prioritize sustainable development that balances economic, social, and environmental objectives for the long-term benefit of current and future generations. Do we have any comment? Uh, 
Okay. Um, Edison, number six. Precautionary principle. In the absence of conclusive scientific evidence on the potential impacts of deep sea mining, the precautionary principle suggests that it is prudent to err on the side of caution and refrain from activities that could cause harm to the environment and human well-being. Okay. Um, can you scroll down, Edison? Lack of wait, lack of technical capacity. Deep sea mining operations require significant energy inputs for exploring, extraction, and processing of minerals. These energy demand, often met by fossil fuels, fu fuel resources, can contribute to greenhouse gas emissions and exacerbate the climate crisis. Moreover, the Philippines possesses an absence in legal and regulatory mechanisms, technical, and capaci technical capacity, and technological advancements to effectively monitor, assess, and evaluate the social, environmental, and economic impacts of deep sea mining operations. Okay, uh, scroll down, please. This is why in 2024, we urge you to take a position in favor of a moratorium or precautionary pause on deep sea mining in the Philippines and globally. Attend the 2024 Assembly of the International Seabed Authority and support the establishment of a general policy for a moratorium on deep sea mining. Ensure that the mining code is not adopted during the duration of the, of the moratorium ex expedited and that no exploitation and contracts are granted by the International Seabed Authority. Um, just a quick comment on number three. I think yeah. you can probably keep expedited, but maybe phrase it as ensure that the mining code is not expedited or adopted during, um, yeah, for the duration of the moratorium. Okay. Yeah, okay. I think that's good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. In the context of a triple planetary crisis, Mini minimal scientific understanding of the deep sea and global equity considerations. A moratorium on, on deep sea mining is the only reasonable way forward. Thank you for your consideration. We we'll look forward to exchanging further with you in a meeting. Yours sincerely, on behalf of Bantai Kita, Philomino Santa Ana, the second. Okay. Um, oh, just a just a one quick thought that maybe is not for integration right now, but um, I wonder if you might want to actively request a meeting, um, maybe sort of nearer the top of the letter. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, maybe you could find a sort of formulation um, to be a bit more kind of active in that request, like saying we we would like to. Yeah. Yeah, something along this, something along those lines. We'd like to request a meeting to discuss these matters further. Um, and perhaps that request could also be reflected in the title of the letter, so that as soon as she opens it, she sees, you know, what what the ask is. Just a suggestion. We'd like to actively request a meeting to discuss these matters further. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, are we done? Uh, Mom Bon Bismanis is raising her hand. Yes, Mom Bon. Uh, yeah, I would like to comment on Emma's uh, suggestion to 
to include uh, like a proposal to request a schedule of a meeting. Um, Emma, what we are planning um, actually is to just uh, send out uh, the letter and then somehow we wanted to get uh, signatures from our members. Uh, I think the way we work with the government, the best way is to have a separate letter requesting a meeting and then we can attach this first letter. Because if we if we have two uh, agenda in our letter, that might be sometimes it's it's difficult to follow up. So I think it's better to just send it first with the signature of uh, of all the interested civil society members, and then we will follow it up with another letter. And in that letter, we will request for a meeting. I, I'm not sure if uh, some uh, CSO members here uh, can also comment on that. Thank you. Okay, Bond, that sounds like a, a great plan. Thanks for clarifying. Okay, thank you, Man Bon. Okay, are we done? Thank you to everyone who participated in the review of the petition. We greatly appreciate all the comments and recommendations provided, each of which has been carefully considered in shaping our stance on the moratorium. At this time, we are going to ask all our speakers to turn their cameras on to begin the open discussion and give our audience an opportunity to ask some questions. Reminder, if you want to ask questions, please enter into the chat box. Do you have any? Oh, there are comments here. Someone is by already by Duncan. Thanks, Angela. Great work. My suggested edits are in doc. Okay. Uh, would be great to know what specific text ATM suggests to include in the petition for addressing seabed quarry and uh, offshore mining. Sorry, JV, that's from Angela. Yeah, well, you know, we we were originally we were not going to push for that, uh, but I recognize that some of the participants are interested. And the reason why I would not actively and aggressively push for that is because of the distinction. Like I mentioned, deep sea mining um, is, uh, while related, is distinct from offshore mining and seabed quarrying. And I fear that if we include offshore mining and seabed quarrying here, uh, Secretary Yulo Saga will pounce on that and then focus on the offshore mining and seabed quarrying and then totally disregard deep sea mining. So thank you for the suggestion. I think it was Roger from Palawan uh, who made that comment. I understand where Roger is coming from, but, but Roger, I think that requires us to have a separate letter Um and and especially there's a different set of issues we want DNR to be accountable about offshore mining and seabed quarrying. But for this specific petition, uh, deep sea mining might merit a a unique letter. And so, as much as we want also to have offshore mining and seabed quarrying tackled here we it might be better placed in a different letter and honestly i i don't think the secretary is ready to discuss offshore mining and seabed quarrying with yeah. us so it's it's probably more realistic you know to go to mgb the mines and geosciences bureau and then have experts from the uh, Bureau of Fisheries and you, the state university and talk to them. Right now, I think this is a good place, a letter, petition to discuss deep sea mining. This will probably generate an interest from the secretary. But if we put seabed quarrying and offshore mining, she might use that opportunity to just discuss offshore mining and then we both lose. We won't get any concrete uh, response about offshore mining and seabed quarrying, and then she gets to disregard deep sea mining. Okay. Thank you. 
Thank you, Sir JB. Um, any response, Angela? No. No, that's good. Thank you so much, Sir JB. So are there any questions, comments? So there are comments here. Thank you, MJ, for your presentation. We'll look forward to working with you more in the future to protect our oceans. And Sir JB, I think an, an important next online activity is a summit of youth environmental leaders to discuss defending the deep sea mining. Thank you so much, Sir JB. And we will take note on that. Maybe um, next few months, Angela will initiate this. Uh, we can apply for SOA DSM micro grant. Uh, its implementation is within 2024. Okay, another um, reaction here from Sir JB. Wow, this is an excellent opportunity. We have a national network of young leaders involved in resisting and challenging mining projects across provinces, and some of them are involved in the in the offshore mining seabed quarrying. Yes, we will uh, invite all the young environmental advocates. Okay, uh, maybe include in the next seabed quarry and offshore mining. Okay. Okay, that's it. Are we done? Hi, I would like to add something. Miss MJ. Um, yes, uh, in, in regards to the microgrant application, the, the deadline is on April 30, which is on eight days. So if um, Sir JB can connect me with the youth organization, um, I think that would be most likely be possible. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Uh, if if I can get your email and then I'll shoot an email to the Secretariat of the Youth Network copying you. Okay. Yeah. I think my bond is also raising her hand. Mom bond, take it away. Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. Sir Jeff, thank you so much. Uh, I would like to also suggest that maybe the signatory of the letter will be the interested civil society members, people's organization, who want who wanted to support this call for moratorium and not only the president of uh, Bataikita. Thank you. Okay. Well taken. I think we're done. The speakers collectively underscore the imperative of implementing a moratorium on deep, on deep sea mining to safeguard marine biodiversity and protect vulnerable ecosystems and uphold the rights of local communities. They emphasized the importance of adopting a holistic approach that integrates environmental conservation, social equity, and sustainable development principles into ocean governance frameworks. By fostering collaboration, transparency, and accountability stakeholders can work to, towards a more resilient and equitable, equitable future for both people and the planet. Uh, sir, sir Jeff, I just had one question. Um, in terms of the petition uh, in relation to Mimban's comment, which I agree with, uh, should we expand the um the petition to include for example interested national and international civil society organizations and concerned citizens who support the call for a moratorium so would it be expanded at the national international level as well as um for individuals that aren't involved in civil society to also be able to um sign the petition i'm wondering yeah what i agree. yes angela i agree that would be so we will be um, expanding the the coverage of the letter or something like that. Perfect. Uh, to cater all uh, interested individuals and groups who wanted to support the moratorium. Thank you. Including international organizations like PWIP. Yeah, we can. I think it's, it's still okay. Uh, because I'm looking at it, uh, majority majority of who will sign and those who we can get support are actually from the Philippines naman. So it's I think it's okay. We will just have to write a distinction in the for example in the in the signature in the signatures uh in the in the in the page that 
that has the signature. So it has to be like uh, the local civil society, national coalition, and then international support groups. And may maybe individuals too. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I also just wanted to add, for example, um, thank you so much, Usula, uh, for sharing the comments. Um, and we're going to be doing research to ensure there's uh, specific provisions and uh, and making sure that Filipino scientists and local communities or specific areas are highlighted. Um, but there might be the cause that there is a lack of research or evidence um, that specifically highlights this in the Philippines um, due to uh, it being a very new topic being discussed um, at the national and local levels. And so um, for now, if everyone at the call agrees that um, with the contents and also agrees on three specific provisions that might be included um, if there is research available on local scientists um, highlighting the urgency of this issue, as well as um, adding reference to specific areas or communities that will be affected, um, please feel free to sign the petition um, either right after the event or alongside your um, specific coalitions so that we can start to expedite the process of, of um, civil society mobilization and sharing the petition with the DNR secretary. So I just want to add that and thank you so much. Thank you, Angela. Uh, yes, ma'am Bond, you're raising your hand. Uh, yeah, just quickly lang. Um, on that, Angela, on the scientific part, or research, or any available uh, references, uh, maybe we will set up another meeting and we and uh, we will uh, link with some friends from UPMSI because there might be some researches that they have done. And I think they all, they're they also part of the, the team that the ISA is engaging in the Philippines. So maybe there's some... Uh, they know some references on that and some local researchers maybe. So I think that's another uh, work for us to organize a meeting with the local scientists. Thank you. Okay. So I think it's already five o'clock. So thank you so much to all our speakers for sharing their knowledge and recommendations with us today. We also want to thank all of our attendees for joining us today of these critical conversations as we continue to pave a shared vision of what transformative natural governance or resource governance looks like for our future. This has been your host, Jeffrey Akarin, signing off. Thank you. Thank you, Camille and Bantay Kita. <laughs>